Good evening, everybody. We're, we're after uh, my uh, previous webinar uh, last week uh, that uh, delved into uh, uh, some flying uh, stuff, more CFI stuff than mechanic stuff. We're going to go back to uh, our usual theme of, of maintenance. Uh, and the title of uh, tonight's webinar, as Tim said, is uh, Trust Your Mechanic But Verify. And basically, um, uh, what I want to talk to you about tonight is uh, is is basically that just because uh, an A&P mechanic recommends uh, that you do something to your airplane doesn't mean that you necessarily have to do it. And it doesn't even necessarily mean that the A&P has diagnosed the situation correctly or that his advice is good. So um, I want to encourage everybody uh, never to improve, uh, never to approve any maintenance that's expensive or invasive without verifying that the diagnosis is correct and that the recommended repair is warranted. And so tonight we're going to go through uh, a bunch of common scenarios that come up all the time, uh, things that, that uh, mechanics uh, bad news that mechanics have for their aircraft owners, I guess, and take a look at uh, at, at each one and how um, that diagnosis needs to be verified before you approve uh, uh, any maintenance action. Um, <clears throat> so let's start off with uh, some things, uh, low compression, burned exhaust valve, high oil consumption, uh, all the kinds of things that might lead a mechanic to say it looks like time for a top overhaul. Uh, we see this happen all the time uh, for uh, the uh, managed maintenance clients of my company. We virtually always decline uh, top overhaul recommendations because it's very, very rare that a top overhaul is, is, is the appropriate remedial action to solve a problem. But mechanics uh, recommend it all the time. Uh, like the mechanic in the picture here, they usually have a big smile on their face when they do it. And the reason is that uh, uh, a top overhaul is, uh, well, for a six-cylinder engine, it's typically a $15,000 uh, ordeal. And uh, um, so uh, from my standpoint, as an advocate for aircraft owners, it's not something we want to do lightly. It would be only something we wanted to do if we we're absolutely convinced that it was necessary. Now, the first thing I want to uh, say is that um, a, a lot of top overhauls are, uh, uh, are recommended on the basis of low cylinder compression. And I've talked about this a number of times before in this webinar series, but we never want to pull a cylinder based uh, solely uh, on, on a low compression uh, reading because the compression test is one of the most inaccurate uh, tests that in, 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 in all of aviation maintenance, and it has been the basis of, for pulling, un unnecessarily pulling cylinders uh, by the tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands. Here's an interesting graph. You may have seen it before because I, I think I've included it in one or two of my, my previous webinars. But um, <clears throat> it's, it's, pr it's pretty interesting. When, when, uh, when an aircraft manufacturer or an engine manufacturer uh, goes to certify a new engine with the FAA, uh, one of the requirements is that they have to torture test the engine for 600 hours. They have to put it through an endurance test during which uh, pretty much all of the critical engine parameters are at redline um, and, uh, and run it for 600 hours and then the engine is torn down at the end of the 600 hours. And it's a really brutal test. The 600 hour torture test uh, is intended to represent um, uh, thousands of hours of, of normal operation because everything is, is being run at redline. So um, this graph came from a 600-hour uh, endurance test that Continental did in their, in their test cell um, to get uh, certification of the TSIO 520UB engine some years ago. And every, uh, every 40, 50 hours or so, they, they would shut the engine down and, and, and uh, um, uh, 
and drain the oil and change the filter and uh, and 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 among other things would would do a compression test on all the cylinders. And this graph plots the compression history of the number two cylinder of that particular engine over the 600-hour torture test. And it's pretty instructive. Take a take a look at these compressions. The the compression started out, and remember this is a brand new engine, um, around 72 over 80. And uh, within 50 hours, the compression had dropped to 66 over 80, and it's uh, it subsequently dropped to 63 over 80, and um, eventually got all the way down to uh, to 56 after about 200 hours of operation. The cylinder, cylinder looks like it's it's really going south, doesn't it? And then, um, and then 50 hours later, they checked it, and it was up to 70. And then it got down to uh, what looks like about 68. And then it started zoomed right back up to 74, which was better than it was when it started. And then it started declining uh, again. Down, it ended the test around 63 uh, over 80. Now, what does that tell you? I mean, do you really think that? from the 200 hour point to the 250 hour point the cylinder suddenly got better and healed itself or or from the 350 hour point to the 450 hour point that 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 the cylinder condition improved in the course of this torture test i mean of course not what this what this graph illustrates is just how bogus compression results can be. How how much noise there is, uh, and frankly, the the you know the signal to noise ratio on compression tests is very very low. Uh, there may be there there may be some some useful information there, but it's buried in a lot of noise. Compression readings just vary all over the place. Uh, they're very non-reproducible. And so we just can't put a lot of faith in compression readings. So we don't ever want to be pulling a cylinder based solely on the basis of a compression reading. Uh, we always want to evaluate the condition of the cylinder by more trustworthy methods uh, before we decide um, make a decision to pull a cylinder. Um, the most trustworthy method that we have uh, what I call the gold standard uh, for assessing cylinder condition is the borescope inspection. Uh, that that's a picture of my my, my friend Adrian Eichhorn, who uh, is one of the world's master of piston uh, aircraft engine boroscopy. Um, he's uh, doing a uh, a borescope inspection on an old Bonanza engine, and uh, he's looking at the results on a big screen TV, and he's looking at an exhaust valve. And um, uh, I'll show you a few, a few uh, images of what we kinds of things we see under the borescope. But the, the borescope is an amazing uh, instrument, particularly a good one like the one that Adrian has set up. And uh, it lets us see uh, what's going on inside a cylinder with excruciating detail, so that there's no need to be relying on a, a, a highly uh, inaccurate and non-reproducible test uh, like the compression test. Let me just show you a couple of borescope images real quick. Uh, <clears throat> first bunch of them, we're, we're looking at, um, uh, at exhaust valves because the, the most common malady that, that, that cylinders have that, that cause them to, uh, to have low compression is uh, uh, exhaust valve leakage where, where, where during the compression test you can hear air coming out of the exhaust pipe. Um, this is a beautiful exhaust valve. Why do I say it's beautiful? Because it's perfectly symmetrical. It looks like a bullseye. Um, and what we're interested in when we look at a, an exhaust valve under the bore scope is whether it's symmetrical or not. If it's, a, it's symmetrical, it means that, that it's running a, a constant temperature all the way around the circumference of the valve, and there's no evidence of any sort of leakage when the engine's running. Uh, if the valve does start to leak, uh, or what we call burn, um, there'll be an asymmetry. Uh, here's another beautiful exhaust valve. Looks a little different than the other one. This one, the, 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 the pilot is, is, uh, is operating engine at leaner mixtures, so the, there are less deposits on the valve. 
Um, but as you can see, it's perfectly symmetrical. It looks like a bullseye. It's exactly what we want an exhaust valve to look like. Here's another one that's a, uh, more of a close-up, so we're not seeing the entire valve. But again, there's no evidence of asymmetry. We're not so interested in the color, because the colors vary all over the place, although there's one color that we don't want to see, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. Um, but what we're interested in is the asymmetry. That little uh, indentation that you can see uh, is, is actually the very center of, uh, of that valve. Uh, here's another exhaust valve. Looks different, but it looks great. It's it's perfectly symmetrical. Looks like a bullseye. That's what we want to see. Um, this valve uh, is um, kind of ugly looking. Uh, it has a, a, an inordinate uh, buildup of lead deposits on it. Um, it pretty clearly came out of an engine where the pilot was not leaning very aggressively and and the combustion was very dirty and, and and was leaving all sorts of deposits on lead deposits on the exhaust valve face but again we're not seeing any significant asymmetry that would indicate that this valve is is leaking or 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 developing any problems so again this would be a healthy valve um, this is the sort of thing we worry about here here's what appears to be and this is pretty pretty much a close up but I'll show you some some uh, uh, some pictures that aren't quite so close up, but but this uh, is an is an asymmetry in a particular area of the uh, the valve circumference uh, that would suggest that this valve is is leaking exhaust valve and uh, exhaust gas in this area. Um, here here's a, a wider view of a similar thing, and again you can see the the asymmetry, and you can see that the valve is developing a hot spot up about the 12 o'clock position. Um, this is a valve that might not need to be removed immediately, uh, but it would need to be, uh, a, a real close eye would need to be kept on it because this valve is on its way uh, to failure. And I, I wouldn't argue with a mechanic who saw a valve like this and recommended pulling the cylinder. If it was my airplane, I'd probably just go another 50 hours and bore scope it again and, and get a little bit more life out of it. But um, uh, you know, most uh, uh, most airplanes are lucky to get a bore scope inspection once a year, and so in that sort of situation, if you see an asymmetry like this, it probably would make sense uh, to to pull the cylinder and uh, and replace the valve. Um, here is a, a valve that's progressed further. You can see the asymmetry is significantly worse. And you can see um, the one color that we don't want to ever see on an exhaust valve up near the top, and it's green. I don't know how well the, the green is showing up uh, via the, the, the webinar link, but um, uh, green is bad. <laughs> uh, it's it's, it's kind of like the opposite of a traffic light. Red is good, green is bad. When we see an uh, ex uh, exhaust valve uh, that it starts to develop a green spot, um, the, the, the green occurs when that part of the exhaust valve is getting way, way too hot to the point that it is starting to jeopardize the integrity of the valve. And a valve that has a green spot like that is one that does not have very much longer to live and really needs to be changed uh, right away. Um, here's an even worse one. The green area has has expanded. Um, here's another shot of, of, of a valve in, in very, very seriously bad condition. Um, and you can see the asymmetry and the appearance of a green a tinge in, in the area where the valve is, is leaking and running too hot. Uh, this one is this, this one's like one of the worst valves I've ever seen. Not only does it have a huge hot spot up there around 12:30. In fact, it's actually when I look at it, it's actually starting to crack up there. It's probably it's probably going to shed a piece of metal within the next hour or two. It's amazing that it was caught right on the threshold of failing. But it's got another hot spot or, or, around the uh, the the. 9.30 or 10 o'clock position and another one down about 6.30. I mean, this, this valve is just coming apart big time. 
So this is this is like the antithesis of a bulls a bullseye, and and this valve is just literally on the verge of failing uh, any moment. Um, here's a, an, another valve again that shows a, shows the asymmetry pattern very very well. It shows a little bit of green tinge at the hot spot. Uh, this valve uh, is probably within hours of, of failing. Um, uh, th this is actually a temperature map uh, that we got from the NTSB that shows uh, that where that where they actually took temperature readings on a on a valve that was um, uh, that was failing and had that kind of asymmetry that we're looking at, a and you can see um, uh, what's happening on the valve. The the, the appearance of the and color of the deposits that we see on the valve face when we look at the in the bore scope are, um, are are basically what we're really looking at is is kind of a temperature map of the valve and uh, uh, when it, it when it develops a hot spot like this one where we're uh, at, at the uh, 12 o'clock position that valve is getting up to about 1650 degrees which is um, more than a, than than a uh, than, than a valve can can uh, comfortably handle uh, the valve is in, in trouble. Uh, if we don't catch it in time, and there's no excuse for not catching it in time today because we have this te this bore scope technology, uh, here's what happens: the the hot spot uh, gets to the point where the valve simply fails. A chunk of metal um, comes loose from the valve. Uh, the cylinder immediately goes to zero compression, no longer can sustain combustion, and shuts down. So we're now flying a five-cylinder engine or a three-cylinder engine. Um, the piece of metal, if it's a normally aspirated engine, hopefully goes out the exhaust pipe. If you're not real lucky, it might wind up getting into another cylinder. Uh, if it's a turbocharged engine, that piece of metal could could wind up going through the the the, uh, the turbine section of the uh, turbocharger and, and and take it out, which uh, would provide some additional collateral damage, but we don't ever want to let valves get to this point. And the best tool we have to prevent this is is uh, bore scoping the uh, the cylinders on a regular basis and looking at the exhaust as well. Uh, here's here's that same failed valve. It, th this one actually came out of uh, one of the cylinders on, on my airplane, but it, it it happened about 20 years ago, back in the bad old days when we didn't have bore scopes and didn't have the ability to to, to monitor these things the way we do today. Uh, and here's another close-up of that valve uh, while it was still in the cylinder before it got removed. Uh, okay, here's here's some other, uh, just a couple other bore scope photos. Um, one of the really useful things to do is is to uh, rotate the prop uh, to open the valve fully, both the intake and exhaust valve, and then use the bore scope to get a, a real good um, uh, view of at least part of the valve uh, face and of the uh, of of the valve seat uh, that contacts the face. Um, and this is this is very very pretty. Um, the portion of the valve that we can see is is nice and shiny, which means it's been uh, having really good contact with the seat, just like it's supposed to. Here, here's a, a photo of an exhaust valve uh, open where we're looking at the seat and you can see a, a bunch of little patchy exhaust deposits on the seat. This is one of the kinds of things that will result in a low compression reading with air coming out the exhaust pipe and yet it typically has absolutely zero effect on the engine when it's running. It's totally, it totally creates an artifact of uh, in, in the compression test, but it really has no effect uh, on the engine when it's running. Um, and so uh, this is one of the reasons that, 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 one of many reasons that the compression readings are so uh, unreliable. Um, here, here's another picture with the exhaust valve open where we can see a, a good portion of the, of the valve in the seat. The seat in this case looks very clean. As you can see, it's got just a few little specks on it, but basically it's quite clean. So at any rate, um, uh, bottom line, if, if you have a low compression reading, don't panic. The, the first thing is that compressions are allowed to get pretty low before we even start to get concerned. Continental uh, allows compressions to get down into the low 40s. Uh, 
Uh, Lycoming has an older, uh, a more outmoded approach, prefers compression readings uh, that are 60 or, or better. Um, uh, but if the compression is, is low, we don't take any action on that compression reading. Uh, we pull out the borescope. In fact, we should be borescoping all the cylinders um, uh, at every annual and any other time that the top spark plug is removed. And for the, the, the aircraft that are on our managed maintenance program, we always require that the shops borescope every cylinder at every annual. Most of the shops don't do that as a regular course. They'll only borescope a cylinder if it has low compression. We want them to borescope all the cylinders. Um, but um, if you borescope a, a low compression cylinder and there are no obvious problems visible under the borescope, then the compression reading is probably bogus uh, because compression uh, testers lie all the time, but borescopes never lie, at least if, if the person looking at the borescope image knows what he's looking for. So in the case that, that, that we have uh, a compression that's, that's lower than... Um, than what the the manufacturer uh, permits, uh, low 40s for Continentals, uh, uh, low 60s uh, for Lycomings, but the borescope inspection doesn't show up any uh, any obvious reason for the low uh, reading. Uh, we want to just go fly the airplane for an hour or so, and then bring it back. And the minute the engine is shut down. Uh, pop the cowling, pull out the top spark plug, and recheck the compression of that of whatever cylinder is in question as hot as possible. And typically, uh, the the borescope, I mean, the compression reading when you do that is going to be uh, usually at least 10 points higher than it was before. Uh, uh, remember, recently we had a a Cirrus who. Uh, had a cylinder that measured 38 out over 80. The shop wanted to pull it off. We said, no, borescope it. They borescoped it. They didn't see anything obviously wrong. We said, let the owner go fly the airplane for an hour and bring it back and check it again hot. He did that, and uh, the, the, on the recheck, it was 72 over 80, which which gives it, you know, an, a, an illustration of just how often these these borescope, uh, I mean, these uh, compression test numbers are unreliable. And this protocol that I'm, I've described, which is to say if the, if the compression is low but the, but the cylinder looks good under the borescope, go fly it and then retest it hot, is precisely the protocol set forth in Continental Service Bullet SBO 3-3, which is probably the best thing that's ever been written on the subject of how to decide when it is necessary to pull a cylinder. And even though it's a continental service bullet, and I recommend uh, following the same basic protocol for Lycomings as well, because it, it, it's very thoughtful, it makes a lot of sense, and, and it basically rec recognizes the fact that, that compression readings are not reliable and uh, borescope inspections are much more reliable. Um, We've been seeing a lot of reports of cracked cylinder heads lately. Uh, mechanics will inspect uh, an engine and, and say, you know, a cylinder uh, has a head crack and needs to come off. Um, on a number of occasions, we've had cases where a mechanic will inspect a, an, an engine and say five cylinders are cracked. And now when a mechanic says five cylinders are cracked, that is clearly wrong because it's just never happens that you know that five cylinders crack all at once it's uh, but in any rate um, uh, what we've what we found is um, is that a very high percentage of reports of cylinder head cracks uh, by AMP mechanics are simply false alarms there is no crack there it may look like a crack but it isn't a crack and um, I, I don't have precise statistics on it, but my general sense is um, that something like 80% of the alleged cylinder head cracks reported by A&Ps during uh, annual inspections turn out to, to be non-cracks. Um, so what we need to do, what we absolutely insist on doing, is that any time a mechanic inspects an engine and reports a, um, a cylinder head crack, 
and says we need to pull a cylinder, um, we always tell the mechanic we're not going to authorize pulling the cylinder until he can prove to us that the crack is real. And the way you prove it is a very simple procedure called a dye penetrant inspection, uh, DPI for short. Um, dye penetrant inspection uh, involves is a, is a very simple and, and, and uh, quick procedure and involves the use of, of three spray cans uh, that literally every mechanic has in his toolbox. Um, it, it comes in a dye penetrant kit. And, uh, and and the three uh, aerosol cans uh, are uh, one is a cleaner, one is what's called a developer, and one is what's called the penetrant. Um, the cleaner is is just a um, a residue free solvent you use to to uh, uh, to clean the area under inspection. The penetrant is a um, is a penetrating oil. Uh, that is dyed with a very bright red dye, and the developer is a is an aerosol white powder, um, very similar to jock itch spray, if you will, probably without the medication. But the developer, when you spray it on something, it just leaves a, a nice uh, coating of of white powder on the surface that you've sprayed it on. And with these three spray cans, uh, we can verify. Uh, or determine whether something that looks like a crack is really a crack or whether it's just a superficial feature that, it, that has no uh, significance. And very quickly, the way the dye penetrant inspection uh, procedure works is, is this. Um, the, the first thing we do is we, is, is we spray the area with the cleaner, which gets rid of, of the, the dirt and grime and stuff um, on the surface and inside the crack and so on, um, if there is a crack. Uh, the next step is that we spray the penetrant on. The, the, the penetrant is, is, a, is a penetrating oil, very low viscosity penetrating oil that is dyed um, uh, bright red. And uh, you, you spray this on the area uh, and you let it sit, you let it soak. Uh, typically for 15, 20 minutes, maybe a half an hour tops, um, to make sure that if there are any cracks in this area, that the cracks will, that the, the penetrating oil has time to to get into those cracks. Then the next step is to is to get out the cleaner again and spray down the area, which will wash away uh, the the the, the penetrate the, the the red dried oil on the surface but we'll leave uh, any red dyed oil that has uh, wicked into cracks intact. And then finally, y you spray on the developer, which is the white powder, and uh, it coats the whole area with a nice white uh, powdery surface. And if there was a crack, um, the red dyed oil will be absorbed by the white powder and will um, result in a very obvious red line that jumps right out at you. Uh, and if you see that red line, you know that there was actually a crack with, with enough depth to it to absorb the, uh, or, or the, um, uh, the penetrant oil. And if you don't see a red line, you know that what you were looking at was some superficial feature that didn't have any depth to it. The problem with a, just a visual inspection is that we don't have the capability of telling whether a what, we, what we, I'd call it crack-like feature, uh, whether that has any depth to it or not, or whether it's just some superficial thing on the surface, maybe a casting mark, maybe a little scratch, that, that doesn't really have any significance in terms of the uh, integrity of, of the part that, 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 we're, that we're looking at. So, for example, um, here is a... Uh, um, a crack-like feature that was reported by an A&P uh, as, as a cracked cylinder head. It emanated from the top spark plug boss, uh, which is probably the most common uh, place that we see cracks forming. And it was headed towards the fuel injector boss on, on, the, uh, uh, on, on the cylinder head. And here's here's a somewhat enlarged picture of it. It's a little bit fuzzy, but that was as, as good as the resolution of the photograph was. Uh, but it, it it definitely looks like a crack. 
Um, and, and anybody who just looked at it with a naked eye would, would say that that looks like a crack. Um, but after the, uh, we, we insisted on dye penetrant inspection and, uh, and the mechanic performed it, here was what the result was. The crack magically disappeared. Uh, there is no red line where that, where that alleged crack was. It wasn't a crack. It was a superficial feature. And so um, the, the cylinder wound up not coming off. Now here's a real crack um, that was dye penned, and you can see uh, there's no question at all that, that, that that's a crack. It, it actually, the, uh, the, the red line <laughs> wound up turning blue because that crack was actually so deep that it, that it penetrated completely into the, into the intake port. And uh, and some blue dyed uh, hundred low lead was was wicking out of the crack into the developer. So uh, the crack started out red, and then after a while it turned blue. But that's a, that's a for real crack. Uh, but the one the thing we looked at before, which looked like a crack, wasn't a real crack. So um, we we always have to uh, insist that that things that look like cracks are verified with a dye a dye penetrant inspection. Uh, before we accept them as real cracks and a legitimate reason for a cylinder to come off. Um, we just never want to accept a, a cylinder head crack diagnosis without uh, requiring a DPI to confirm it. And again, in my experience over the last five years or so that we've been managing you know, hundreds and hundreds of, of airplanes and getting lots and lots of these cracked cylinder head reports, on the order of 80% of them turn out to be bogus, and after the DPI is done, the, the crack manage, magically goes away. An even worse uh, diagnosis would be a cracked crankcase, because a cracked cylinder head just re would mean you need to change the cylinder, but a cracked crankcase means you've got to pull the engine and, and tear it down or probably overhaul it. Um, <clears throat> so it's even more important that if a mechanic says that you've got a crankcase crack, uh, that that crack has to be verified with, with DPI um, before you accept the diagnosis as being correct. Um, you know, and sometimes when you ask a mechanic to do that, sometimes they, you know, they, they get a little snippy and say, hey, I've been doing this for 35 years. I know a crack when I see one. But, you know, I mean, that's, that, that's sort of a silly uh, thing to say because the human eye cannot look at a crack and determine whether it has any depth. You have to use non-destructive testing methods, the simplest of which is, uh, is DPI, in order to, to get a three-dimensional view of, of that crack and whether it actually is penetrating into the surface any, any significant distance or not. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're very insistent and uh, um, Sometimes the mechanics are, aren't aren't pleased that that we're questioning their ability to 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 determine cracks with the naked eye, but frankly, nobody can do that. Uh, here's an example of a of what looks like a crack. I don't know if you can see it um, uh, in the uh, in a in a in a crankcase, and it 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 looks like a crack. And after it, it was dye penetrant inspected that there's, there's no evidence of a crack. It went away. Uh, here, on the other hand, is another thing that, that looks like it, it, pretty innocuous, but it, looks, it could be a crack or it could be a scratch. It's a little hard to tell right there under, uh, under that through bolt. And after dye penetrant, it, it was applied to that. <laughs> look, look what happened. I mean, the, the crack is huge. It's way longer than, than was was apparent with just the naked eye, and there's absolutely no question that that, that crankcase has a serious crack. So, I mean, this gives you uh, an illustration just how important it is to, to verify cracks using DPI. And it's a very, like I said, it's a very simple procedure. Every mechanic has a, has a DPI kit in its toolbox, and, you know, you just uh, spend a few minutes spraying this stuff on, you let it soak for a while, you put the developer on, and then you take a picture, <laughs> and that's all there is to it. Uh, another thing while we're talking about crankcase cracks, which are, is important to mention, is that not all 
crankcase cracks are non are, are unairworthy. Um, that sounds a little funny, but it's true. Uh, th this is a diagram out of a Continental Service Bulletin, uh, where a Continental actually divides the crankcase into two areas, what they call the critical area and the non-critical area. And on a Continental crankcase, the non-critical area is, is, is basically the area above a line that connects all of the upper cylinder hold down uh, studs and, and through bolts as you can see um, and what Continental says is that uh, that that in that non-critical area up in the top of the crankcase um, cracks are allowed as long as they don't exceed two inches in length and are and are not uh, actually uh, leaking oil um, so when we see a crack in the non-critical area uh, we don't have to condemn the engine. We typically just um, will mark the ends of the cracks with a with a scribe, so that we can monitor their progress, and then we recheck them every every oil change. And uh, as long as they're not growing, um, everything is cool, and the engine can remain in service. If they do wind up growing uh, to uh, and, and to a point that exceeds two inches in length. Or if they uh, are, they start leaking oil. Then we have to uh, then then we have to take the engine out of service. Um, in the critical area uh, below that that line, uh, the Mason Dixon line or whatever we're going to call it, um, uh, any crack uh, that is, that is verified with dye penetrant um, uh, makes the the uh, the, the crankcase uh, unairworthy, even if it's only an inch long or something. But in the non-critical area, uh, cracks up to two inches in length are acceptable, and that's important to know. So we never want to accept a crankcase crack diagnosis without confirmation by DPI. And we also want to make sure that the crack isn't one of these acceptable cracks that don't require us to, uh, uh, to pull the engine out of service. Engine making metal. I actually did a whole webinar on that not too many months ago. Um, but but I, I since we're on the on the subject of of, uh, of trust but verify, I thought I would go through this very quickly uh, one more time. Um, what we what we find out uh, repeatedly is that uh, mechanics will cut open an oil filter, find some metal in the filter. And go into total freakout mode and tell the, the the owner that this is a catastrophe. The engine needs to be torn down, and we need to uh, we need to resist that temptation. Uh, we see metal in the filter all the time. Often it is not a big deal. Uh, just a quick uh, review of the of how the oil system and these engines work. Um, the the oil starts in the oil pan or oil sump. And goes through a fairly coarse screen called a suction screen that's at the end of the oil pickup tube. Um, the purpose of the suction screen is to prevent the oil pump from ingesting any large pieces of metal that might damage the pump. Uh, and so uh, uh, the, the the suction screen will will catch anything that's larger than than uh, than a, about a sixteenth of an inch uh, in diameter. Um, anything smaller than that uh, will go through the suction screen, go through the oil pump. The oil pump has an oil pressure relief valve, which which uh, regulates oil pressure, and then the regulated uh, the 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 pressure regulated oil then goes through the oil filter, and from the oil filter it it uh, goes up into the um, engine oil galleries and lubricates everything that needs to be lubricated, and then the oil eventually falls back into the oil sump and, and the whole process uh, starts again. So the suction screen catches the big stuff larger than say a sixteenth of an inch in diameter. The, it, it, the coarseness of that screen varies a little bit from engine to engine. The oil filter catches small stuff that got past the suction screen. Um, and uh, But the oil filter um, can only filter down to Somewhere on the order of of, uh, of uh, 50 microns. Anything smaller than that will pass through the oil filter, and will just circulate harmlessly uh, in the oil and won't bother anything. So um, 
we need to uh, uh, break down uh, metal in the engine as being three basic size categories, which I call big stuff, small stuff, and tiny stuff. Now, the, the oil filter is what catches the small stuff to, to inspect it. We cut open the oil filter with a can cutter and then spread out the, uh, the oil filter medium, which is a pleated paper uh, medium, and inspect it very carefully under a strong light and sometimes under a magnifying glass. Um, as I said, big stuff uh, won't get to the filter because it's, it's caught in a suction screen. And tiny stuff will pass right through the filter, and even if it didn't pass through the filter, it would be too small for us to see with a with a naked eye or a magnifying glass, so so it, it wouldn't be interesting anyway. Um, so stuff like this, uh, which is a lot of ferrous metal whiskers ad adhered to a mechanics uh, a magnetic probe, uh, that probe's about a quarter of an inch in diameter to give you a, a size reference. Um, that's the sort of thing we'll definitely catch in the oil filter. And I can just tell from the shape of the metal, the fact that it's long whiskers instead of little tiny particles or something, that that, that metal came from a cam lobe coming apart because that's just the characteristic shape of the metal that's generated when the cam and lifters come apart. Uh, big stuff like this uh, will not will never show up in the oil filter because it won't get to the oil filter. It'll be caught in suction screen. Now, light combing engines are cleverly designed so that the suction screen can be uh, r fairly readily removed and inspected. And the light combing service instructions call for removing and inspecting the suction screen at every oil change, um, although not uh, a lot of mechanics skip that step. Um, but if there's any big, big hunks of metal floating around in, in your engine, uh, uh, you know, larger than a sixteenth of an inch, um, you're not going to find them in the oil filter. You're going to find them in the uh, in the suction screen. So if you have a light combing engine, you want to make sure that you or your mechanic, whoever's doing the, the oil changes, are inspecting the suction screen on a regular basis. Continentals, unfortunately, are not designed with a suction screen that's removable and inspectable. Um, uh, in, in some kind of engines, you can you, you can get a look at the suction screen with a bore scope stuck up through the oil drain plug, but it's a real messy procedure. It gets oil all over the, the bore scope lens and stuff, so uh, so we hardly ever do that. So the best way to find big stuff in a Continental engine is to drain the oil through a, a piece of a window screen or 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 some cheesecloth, like in this picture, uh, and see if uh, if there's any metal that that drains out of the uh, out of the oil sump uh, that that was caught by the suction screen and, and didn't didn't proceed to get to the oil filter. Um, so again, three sizes of metal to see the big stuff. If we can inspect the suction screen, like on a light combing, we do that. Otherwise, we we uh, we uh, filter the drained oil and and look there. Small stuff, we cut open and inspect the uh, media in the oil filter. And tiny stuff, uh, the only way to detect that is to send an oil sample uh, to a lab for spectrographic analysis. And we're a big believer in doing that. All of our managed maintenance airplanes are on a regular uh, program of oil analysis. Um, when we find metal, uh, obviously the first question is, where is it coming from? Um, there are a few tests we can do in the field. We can check it with a magnet to see if it's ferrous or non-ferrous. We can look at it under a magnifying glass and a bright light to see if it has a recognizable shape. For example, those, those whiskers that I showed you in a previous slide uh, have a very recognizable shape and they typically come from, from a cam lobe coming apart. Or we can, have, if, if it's not obvious where the metal's coming from, and often it's not, uh, we can send it out to a lab for scanning electron microscope analysis. Now, this is totally different than oil analysis. In fact, we use a whole different lab for it. Um, but they can put the metal that, that was found in a filter under a scanning electron microscope, and they can determine the exact size, shape, quantity, uh, and, and the exact alloy of the metal. And usually with that information, we have a pretty good idea where it was coming from. Um, the scanning light electron microscope analysis sounds scary, but it typically costs about a hundred bucks, and it's a uh, hundred bucks to to do the analysis is a lot cheaper than starting to take the engine apart. So we, if we see 
significant metal in the filter and it's not obvious to us where it's coming from, uh, we almost always will send it out to, to a lab uh, to have it put under scanning electron microscope for analysis. Again, this is kind of a thing we, we, we couldn't do 10 years ago, but it's commonplace today. Uh, very few mechanics do it. A lot of mechanics don't even know it's available. Um, but but in my mind, it's, it's very important. Um, we typically send our oil samples for spectrographic analysis to Blackstone Labs in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and our um, metal from the filter when, when we need it analyzed to aviation laboratories in Kenner, Louisiana, right by, uh, uh, by New Orleans uh, Airport. Um, so we find some metal in the filter. How do we decide how much metal is enough to ground the airplane? How can we tell whether it's okay to continue to fly the airplane or whether we have to, uh, uh, whether we have to, to, to ground the airplane? Well, Continental doesn't say anything about this. Um, I've, I've actually begged the guys at Continental to come out with a service bulletin, but they, they, they don't seem to want to do that. But Lycoming has an excellent service bulletin called Service Instruction 1492D. It has a very implausible title, Piston Pin Plug Wear <laughs> Inspection. And as a result, hardly any mechanics even know that the service bulletin exists. But it's one of the most, it, it's, it's one of the most valuable uh, service bulletins that Lycoming has. Um, uh, much like the uh, the Continental Service Bulletin on, on boroscope inspections and deciding when to pull a cylinder, this is a terrific service bulletin that gives a real cookbook approach to deciding what to do when you have metal in the filter. Um, and uh, I, I know you can't read this, so I'll give you the highlights, but basically uh, uh, this uh, service bulletin um, gives you some detailed information about when uh, it's okay to fly and when it's not okay to fly. So let's look at the okay to fly section of the service bulletin. And basically what it says is this. It says if we see one to nine small pieces of metal, I define small as being uh, metal that's less than a sixteenth of an inch in diameter, so it's metal that, 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 that that actually got through the section screen into the filter. Um, uh, we don't care about it. Fly normal oil change interval and reinspect. No big deal. If it's 10 to 20 small pieces of metal, fly for 25 hours and reinspect. If it's 20 to four pieces of uh, 20 to 40 pieces of uh, small pieces of metal, fly for 10 hours and reinspect. In other words, the more metal we see in the filter, the the less uh, the, the the sooner we want to recheck. If it's more than 40 pieces of metal and Lycoming uh, gets uh, uh, fairly upset about it and, and wants to take a very cautious approach. So if there's more than 40 pieces of metal found in the filter, um, they want to do want you to do a ground run for 20 to 30 minutes and then cut open the filter. If the filter is clean, fly the airplane for one to two hours and then cut open the filter again. And if it's still clean, then go fly for 10 hours and cut open the filter. Um, the whole, whole idea uh, of this protocol is that as long as there's not a huge amount of metal in the filter, we don't want to down the aircraft. What we want to do is reinspect on a regular basis uh, to figure out which way the needle is moving. In other words, words, are things getting worse or things getting better? If things are getting better, then that metal probably came from some kind of a transient event. Um, and, and it's, and, and it's going to resolve itself and we don't have to worry about it. Uh, on the other hand, if things are getting worse, then that metal represents the beginning of a deteriorating trend and we need to worry about it a lot. But without doing this fly and reinspect, fly and reinspect, we have no way to determine which way the needle is moving. And so that's why Lycoming encourages you to keep the airplane in service unless there's a huge amount of metal in the filter. Now, um, at some point, Lycoming uh, draws the line and says it's not okay to fly. And what they say about that is, if you find any large pieces of metal greater than a sixteenth of an inch in diameter, that's stuff that you'd find in the suction screen, they say ground the aircraft and investigate. 
And frequently, a, a piece of metal that large will have an identifiable shape to it, and, and, and it will be easy to figure out where it came from. Um, but if, if there are any large pieces of metal that were so big that they were caught by the suction screen, then uh, Lycoming doesn't want us to fly the engine until we have figured out where that large piece of metal came from. That's pretty common sense. If there's more than a quarter of a teaspoon of metal in the oil filter, ground the aircraft and again investigate where it came from. Now a quarter of a teaspoon of metal is a huge amount of metal. If you found a quarter of a teaspoon of metal in your oil filter, you would uh, uh, get pretty upset. It's, that's just a gigantic amount of, of metal. Um, and it says if there's more than half a teaspoon of metal in the oil filter, uh, then just uh, uh, game over, remove engine for a teardown. Well, in all the years I've been doing this, I have never seen anything remotely close to a half a teaspoon of metal in an oil filter. That that would just be a gigantic amount of metal. So the, the bottom line is that Lycoming is saying unless there's an, a very large amount of metal in the filter, we don't want to ground the engine. We don't want to do anything radical. We we want to to sample and you know, fly and resample, fly and resample, figure out what's going on. Now, as I mentioned before, Continental provides no guidance at all on this subject, no how much is too much kind of guidance. Um, and in my judgment, um, with, in the absence of any guidance from Continental, uh, I think it's quite reasonable to use the Lycoming protocol even for Continental engines. Um, um, you know, my theory is that, that some guidance is always better than no guidance, and Lycoming's guidance strikes me as being very, very thoughtful and very, very, very reasonable. Uh, your, your IA may, may not agree with that, but that's the approach that we take uh, with respect to the to the airplanes that we manage. Engine burning oil close to TBO. Let's talk about that stuff a little bit. Um, again, common kind of mechanic reaction, this engine is fully depreciated and it's time to replace it. Um, a little bit about uh, engines burning oil. Um, if your engine is using an excessive amount of oil, um, which I would uh, classify as being something greater than a quart in three hours, um, first of all, it's not a safety of flight item. No airplane ever fell out of the sky because it was burning a lot of oil. Um, but but it is a health, an engine health issue, uh, and it's one. So it's one we want to we want to spend some effort diagnosing. And that if, if if the engine is is burning a lot of oil, the threshold question is, where is the oil going? How is it getting out of the engine? Um, and and there's basically um, three possibilities, and, and only three. And so the first step in diagnosing an oil consumption problem is to figure out which of these three uh, exit routes, if you will, we're, we're dealing with. One possibility is it's going out the engine breather. That's probably the most common situation when we have a high oil consumption. And if it's going out the engine breather, you're going to see a lot of oil on the belly. That will that will be the the, the easy to observe uh, symptom that tells you that that this is where the oil is going. It's going out the engine breather. Uh, the second possibility is it's leaking from the engine somewhere. The engine developed a leak, and if that's the case, you're going to see a big oily mess in the engine compartment, and that again is you know very very easy to spot. The third possibility is that it's being actually consumed in combustion. You know, we use the term oil consumption very loosely, but most of the time when when an engine is using a lot of oil, it's it's not actually oil consumption. It, it's, it's throwing the oil out the breather. It's not actually consuming it. But one way that, that, that an engine can use oil is to actually consume it in combustion, uh, which means that the oil is getting into the combustion chamber of one or more cylinders uh, and being burned up. And if that's the case, then the, the, the key observation is that 
the residue inside of the tailpipe or tailpipes um, will be dark and oily rather than the normal light powdery appearance. So um, each of these three escape routes leaves a, various, a very obvious clue and in about 10 minutes uh, you can figure out which of these three the, the, that we're dealing with. Now unless you're seeing tons of oil on the belly and your oil is turning dark very rapidly after each oil change indicating that the problem is high blow by and, and, and the oil is being blown out the breather, don't allow anybody to remove a cylinder to correct the high oil consumption because if the oil consumption is being caused by an engine leak or by actual consumption, that is oil getting into the combustion chamber, um, then the cylinders don't need to come off uh, because it's not, it's not a high blow-by problem. Um, what if the engine is at or near TBO when this happens? Well, I think most of you who have read any, any of the stuff I've written know my opinion about this. TBO has nothing to do with it. Um, the engine TBO is, at least in my view, a thoroughly discredited concept. It, I mean, it, 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 it dates back from the 50s. Um, nowadays, everybody who really has studied this situation knows that that, that the whole notion that an engine has some specific numerical useful life after which it should be retired is just doesn't make any sense. Uh, the airline stopped uh, stopped uh, retiring engines at TBO in the 60s. The military stopped doing it in the 70s. Uh, we don't do it anymore uh, in the in the you know the big biz jet uh, part of general aviation, uh, and and pretty much only. Uh, Piston GA is still doing this business about euthanizing engines at TBO. Um, I've been talking and writing about this for a long time. Uh, I am seeing more and more aircraft owners um, uh, run their engines past TBO, but a lot of owners are still uncomfortable with it. Most mechanics are still uncomfortable with it. Uh, and it's going to take a long time to get this old, outmoded notion out of the system. Um, but TBO just doesn't make any sense because TBOs are based on time and service measured in operating hours and calendar years. And time and service is not what determines how long our engines will last. They don't wear based on time and service. The primary factors that limit the, life, the useful life of a, of, a, of a piston aircraft engine, the number one factor is corrosion. Uh, during periods of disuse. Uh, we rust these engines out of service much, much more often than we wear them out. We almost never wear them out. Um, and, and the reason that aircraft engines often don't reach TBO is not because we're flying them too much, it's because we're flying them too little and we're letting them sit around and without proper corrosion protection and they're, they're rusting and we lose cams and stuff like that and, and that's what takes the engines out of service. The other thing that affects longevity is operator abuse, cold starts, uh, operating in excessive CHTs, things like that. Um, that if that same engine were operated with a reasonable amount of, of TLC uh, would not be limiting the life of the engine. The manufacturer's TBOs are a one-size-fits-all number, which doesn't make any sense. I mean, does it make sense to use the same TBO for an airplane tied down outdoors in Tampa, Florida, the corrosion capital of the universe, or one that is hangered in Tucson, Arizona, where where they they send airplanes to the boneyard that that will sit there for 30 years and and be in perfect shape at the end of that time? I mean, it's, it's crazy to use the same TBO for both of those cases. Or does it make sense to, to use the same TBO for an airplane uh, that flies 400 hours a year on long trips versus one that flies 40 hours a year for $100 hamburgers? Obviously, the one that flies 400 hours a year is going to have a much better uh, lifespan than the one that flies 40 hours a year. So, And published TBOs take 
none of this stuff into account. The, the published TBOs are, the whole TBO notion is based on this concept that engines are reliable for a certain amount of time and then they start to wear out and get less reliable and eventually they get, uh, if they get old enough, they get unreliable enough that, that we can't accept it. So we set a TBO to try to voluntarily take the engine out of service before it gets into this area of wear out zone risk. But we know that that's not even remotely close to what uh, the, the, the engine failure probability curve looks like. We know it looks more like this. This is what engineers call a bathtub curve for obvious reasons. And that there are two areas of, of, of risk. Uh, a, a big one when the engine is young called the infant mortality zone. And then one when the engine gets sufficiently old called a wear out zone. And if we have a curve that looks like this, does it really make sense to overhaul an engine at TBO and in an attempt to avoid getting into the wear out zone, we voluntarily put ourselves right back into the infant mortality risk area. Um, this is this is a tough question because it's like, you know, out of the frying pan into the fire. Um, and so the decision as to whether it would even make sense to overhaul an engine at TBO really depends a lot on what the shape of the curve looks like at the left side and the right side. And unfortunately, while we have a, a lot of information about the left side of the curve, we have very little information about the right side of the curve because there are very few people like me that are running our engines way past TBO. And so we have very few data points out at the right side um, just because of the, the prevailing maintenance culture. But if the right side of the curve it looks more like this and is very flat, um, the, the flatter it is, the, 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 the more it doesn't make sense to be overhauling the engine at TBO because the wear out zone risk is very low and the infant mortality risk is very high. So what do we know about this stuff? Well, um, a fellow by the name of Nathan Ulrich, who is a, a, a PhD a, a reliability engineer and also a Bonanza owner, uh, did a study uh, in 2007 of five years worth of NTSB accident data where he looked at, at the actual accidents involving small piston powered GA airplanes uh, for which the NTSB attributed engine failure as the probable cause or a contributing factor to the accident. He excluded air race airplanes and agricultural application airplanes to, to get rid of those sort of, you know, the crazy operations and, and then and came up with uh, the following interesting results. Th this was the analysis of how many accidents occurred as a function of, d during that five year period, as a function of um, hours since the engine was built, rebuilt, or overhauled. Um, and you can see that the number of, of engine failure accidents was extremely high at the left side of the curve when the engines had um, zero to 500 hours, basically and then monotonically decreased as the engines got older and showed no signs of, of, uh, of ticking back up, uh, even out to 3,000 hours. Uh, the reason the 3,000 or more uh, curve is, is a little bit higher, uh, uh, bar is a little bit higher, is because uh, all the other bars represent a 500 hour increment, the 3,000 or more it, you know, represents a, every, everything beyond that. But, but basically, there was no indication that, um, th that we have any sort of increase in engine failure accidents as engines get older and go beyond TBO. Uh, but there was a very clear indication that we have a, a, a rather extraordinary number of, of engine failure accidents with young engines. Uh, here he plotted it uh, by, as a function of calendar years since the engine was built, rebuilt, or overhauled. And again, pretty much the same pattern. It's uh, even, even more dramatic. The, by far the highest risk of falling out of the sky due to an engine failure accident is going to occur when the engine is young, not when the engine is, is old. Um, now we have to be a little careful about what we read into this data. Uh, we can't really say that that the, the risk of running past TBO is low because there's 
there are so few airplanes flying beyond TBO that it's no big surprise that we aren't seeing a lot of accidents with engines beyond TBO. The really striking thing ab about the uh, about the study is is just how serious the infant mortality risk is. The, the fact that young engines um, have a lot of catastrophic problems that cause airplanes to fall out of the sky, either due to um, uh, bad parts that get installed in the engines when they're built, or um, assembly errors that occur when the engines are built. Those are the the, the two big big risks. So um, we can say with, with certainty that the risk of a catastrophic in-flight engine failure is very high when the engine is young, uh, declines rapidly as the engine gets older. There's no evidence that, that, that we're ever running into a wear-out zone. Um, I mean, I expect that there probably is a wear-out zone somewhere out there, but nobody's, nobody's even getting close to, to, to getting there. Um, if there is a wear out zone, uh, everything from everything I've seen, it's it's probably begins at two or three times published TBO or something like that. Way way the heck out there. It's not. Uh, there are very few engines flying uh, at at that age uh, that that we even have any data to suggest that that there's a, a wear out zone risk. Um, we never want to overhaul an engine because of anything that involves cylinders. That's silly, and and we see that happen a lot. That 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 you know compressions get low, oil consumption gets high, and and the manu and and the mechanic suggests, well, it must be time to uh, to overhaul the engine. That's just pure silliness. Um, cylinders are bolt-on accessories, just like alternators and magnetos. Uh, nowadays, they're exceedingly cheap. Uh, typical new cylinder is is you know, a thousand dollars, maybe fifteen hundred dollars tops. Um, not much more expensive than an alternator or a magneto. Um, and uh, so, if we have a problem with the cylinder, we we pull it off and repair it or replace it, and keep flying. I mean, it's just crazy to be tearing down an engine because of a cylinder problem because cylinders come off and go back on fairly easily. Uh, if somebody told you that. You had a bad magneto, so you should overhaul your engine. I mean, that wouldn't pass the laugh test. Um, you just fix the magneto, and the same thing uh, uh, occurs to cylinders. So never let anything that happens to cylinders affect your decision about when to overhaul. Uh, don't overreact to one bad oil report. As I said, I'm a big fan of oil analysis. We do it on all our managed maintenance airplanes, but you can't really you can't really read very much into any single oil report, no matter how bad it is, um, because again, we need to figure out which way the oil, which way the needles are moving on a on a situation, and it takes at least three oil reports to establish which way the needle is moving, and whether we're dealing with some kind of a transient issue that's resolving itself, or whether we're dealing with the beginning of a deteriorating trend that we should be worrying about. Now, if we do have one bad oil report, we'll often put the, the, the airplane on a shorter oil change interval so we can gather data more rapidly. Um, but we never you know, do anything precipitous. I mean, there's nothing that, that could appear in an oil report that would cause me to uh, conclude that an airplane should stop flying. I mean, the stuff that, that we see in oil reports are little microscopic particles of metal that can't possibly affect the operation of an engine. They typically are very early warning signs uh, of, of something that, that might present a problem quite a far distance in the future. And um, it's, it's good information, and so we are pretty serious about looking at it, but we don't, uh, we, we don't ever uh, do anything precipitous because of a bad oil report. Um, and also don't react to metal in the filter. We, we don't ground an engine because of metal in the filter unless there's a huge amount of metal in the filter. And I just went through the, the, the Lycoming service instruction with you and you know Lycoming basically says if it's less than a quarter of a teaspoon we want to keep the airplane in service and, and, and keep resampling and see which way the needles is moving. Uh, things that would warrant tearing down an engine, a very large amount of metal in the oil filter that can't be accounted for like we talked about. 
a crankcase crack that is beyond acceptable limits or, or a critical area of the crankcase, a serious oil leak that can't be cured without splitting the case, uh, some obvious unairworthy condition, say uh, we, we pull a cylinder off and, and we discover that, uh, that, that the cam lobe is, is, is in, in serious condition. Um, maybe a prop strike, a, a, a significant uh, engine overspeed, say 10% over redline, or some other event that clearly requires a teardown. Uh, those are the kinds of things that would that that would cause me to say it's 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 time to pull the engine, send it off to an engine shop. Um, but but nothing short of that. Certainly nothing involved with cylinders. Here are the kinds of things that 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 would that that, that would happen that would cause one to say, oh, I guess we're going to have to bite the bullet and either tear down the engine or replace it. And you know, as I mentioned, I, I practice what I preach on this thing. Engines on my airplane are uh, both uh, now well beyond 200% of TBO. The oil filters are metal free. The oil analysis looks good. The engines make full rated power. Um, and uh, I have no intention of tearing these engines down and until they, they they tell me it's time with with one of the kinds of things we just talk, talked about. So in summary, in summary. Um, we never want to pull a jug because of low compression. Uh, we always want to borescope it. If the if the engine has low com if the cylinder has low compression but it looks good under the borescope, the low compression reading is probably bogus. We want to go fly the airplane and check it again. Um, a cracked cylinder head diagnosis has to be verified with uh, with die penetrant inspection because the vast majority of 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 cylinder head cracks that are diagnosed by ANPs are simply not not real cracks, and they magically disappear when you spray the dye penetrant on. Uh, a crack can, a, a, a crankcase cracks, the same thing. We have to; those are obviously much more serious, and we always uh, need to verify those with dye penetrant uh, inspection. Uh, also, have to verify that the crack is actually an unacceptable crack before we we we, uh, we ground the airplane, pull the engine. Uh, don't overreact to metal in the filter. The Lycoming uh, protocol is is a, makes a lot of sense, and, uh, and and we even use it for Continentals. Um, don't overreact to one bad oil report. Um, uh, again, we, we we need to get at least three oil samples uh, to to figure out which way the needles are moving, and pay no attention to engine TBO. It, it's it's just nonsense. Um, uh, keep good tabs on engine condition and let the engine tell you when it's time. Um, so trust your mechanic but always require verification before approving anything that's inexpensive or invasive and verification you know could could mean a bore scope inspection it could mean a die penetrant inspection it could mean go going through a meticulous uh, um, diagnosis uh, uh, to figure out why the engine's consuming oil, that sort of thing. We always want to make sure that we're doing that. So um, uh, that's it. Uh, uh, Tim, I, well, I guess we have a little bit of time probably for Q&A, but not a whole lot. Uh, upcoming first Wednesday of the uh, month webinars, uh, the one in December is about TBOs and other maintenance intervals. Um, January is is my airplane too broken to fly about inoperative equipment and what the rules are about that, and in February, how to flunk an annual inspection that talks about having uh, annuals signed off as unairworthy and why you might actually want to do that. Um, I don't know how much uh, how much Q and A time we have, Tim, but uh, but if we do, let's let's do a couple. Great. Uh, yeah, let's get into it. Uh, we got uh, a few minutes left here and, uh, and a number of questions. So uh, some questions about bore scopes. Um, do you have any recommendations about um, a suitable bore scope costing under $1,000? Uh, yes, I do. Um, uh, actually, Snap-on, about six months ago, came out with a very, very nice digital bore scope capable of capturing digital images and uh, taking movies. It's, it's got excellent optics. It's got excellent lighting. It's got all the stuff we're looking for. And 
it has a magic price point, $995 from your favorite Snap-on truck. So um, uh, today, that's that's what I recommend when when people ask me for bore scope recommendation. Uh, uh, don't don't buy any of the earlier Snap-on bore scopes. Uh, uh, the, but the B the B uh, the BK 8000, which is their latest and greatest, is uh, is a very very nice instrument, and it's it's under a thousand bucks, just by five bucks. <laughs> Great. Uh, Tom wonders, how often should uh, bore scope uh, be done? Is it, is it routine or on condition? Um, well, it's, it's not on condition because, because we use it to determine condition. Um, at minimum, I, I, the, the, what we practice in our uh, managed maintenance practice is that every cylinder of every, air pl of every aircraft needs to be bore scoped at every annual inspection. And that's something that, in my experience, you're going to have to specifically ask the shop to do unless you're going to do it yourself, um, because most shops uh, don't do that routinely. Um, personally, um, it seems to me that any time a top spark plug is out of a cylinder, it's nuts not to stick a bore scope in and take a look around. I mean, if you were pulling a jug, wouldn't you stick your head in the hole and look at the cam? It, it would be almost criminally negligent not to do that. And I feel the same way about, about uh, bore scopes. It's, it's, if, if the top cowling is off and the top spark plug is removed and you've got a hole in the top of the cylinder, well, for Pete's sake, stick a bore scope in and look around. It, it, what will it take, 10 minutes? It just, it just, just makes sense. Great. Paul asks, uh, should you bore scope an engine immediately after engine shutdown or wait a certain amount of time? Well, it makes absolutely no difference when you do it. Uh, it's not like a compression test where you have to do it hot. Uh, I, I would not recommend bore scoping the engine immediately after engine shutdown just because you're likely to burn your fingers if you do. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, what we, see the, what we see with a bore scope looks exactly the same whether the engine is hot or cold. It's, so it's not at all like, uh, like a compression test. We always want to do the compression test just as hot as we possibly can. I usually wear gloves when I do them. But the bore scope inspection, there's no reason to, to, to do it hot. So it's, it's, it's more comfortable to do it cold. Okay, Terry says, uh, I've listened to your discussions before on hot spots on exhaust valves, asymmetric color formations on exhaust valves, burnt valves, etc. What causes this asymmetric heating phenomenon and what can we as pilots do in our operations to prevent it? Well, uh, the, the, first, the first part is easy, the second part isn't easy. The, 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 what causes the asymmetric heating is very simple. Um, um, the, what causes the asymmetric heating is that there is a spot around the circumference of the exhaust valve that isn't sealing perfectly to the seat during the combustion event and a small amount of, of, of combustion gas which is extremely hot I mean the, the peak combustion gas temperature uh, typically is up around you know over some, somewhere north of 3500 degrees Fahrenheit uh, and a small amount of that gas uh, is is escaping past this, you know, malformation of, in in the valve and the seat, and because the gas is so hot, and because that specific point on the exhaust valve where the gas is leaking is not making good contact with the seat and is is not it, it, it has basically lost its heat sink, uh, the valve is being exposed to um, a gas temperature in that area that it, that it can't possibly deal with and so the valve starts to lose there starts to be some metal erosion and there starts to be some warping uh, frequently and the more metal erosion and warping there is the, the, the bigger the leak and the bigger the leak the, the, the hotter the hot spot gets because more of this very hot gas is escaping and so once you get even the tiniest leak um, you start. You have started on this sort of downhill death spiral, and eventually that valve's going to fail un unless the the situation is detected and the valve is taken out of service. Um, it never it never gets better. It always it always gets worse, and it gets worse at an accelerating rate as the as the hot spot 
uh, uh, gets worse and worse. What can pilots do about it? Um, well, it's th that's a lot less clear um, because the, the, you know the, the question is well, why why do these things burn? They they uh, well, I mean why do the hot spots develop? Uh, they can develop because the cylinder wasn't set up properly when it was either manufactured or when it was overhauled, uh, and the, uh, the the valve and the seat were not perfectly concentric. Uh, there were some periods of time, uh, oh, back in the late 90s and early 2000s, when Continental was turning out cylinders with very poor valve geometry that would typically get to five, six, seven hundred hours and, and, and burn their valves. Uh, they, they fix that now, but, but, but improper manufacturing is one thing that can cause this. Another thing that can cause it is, um, is where in the exhaust valve guide that lets the exhaust valve, the, the, where the guide isn't holding the valve perfectly centered in the seat, it gets kind of sloppy. And the sloppier sloppy it gets, the more likely it is uh, for the valve not to close perfectly concentrically with the seat and 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 uh, allow some leakage of gas. Um, there is some stuff that the pilot can do about that, and and that is uh, leaning very very aggressively, particularly during ground operations. Um, and, and the reason that's important is because. Um, the more aggressively you lean, the 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 cleaner the combustion and the less deposits wind up on the on the valve stem, and it's mostly uh, deposits that form on the valve stem that wind out uh, that, that wind up grinding out the uh, the bore of the exhaust valve guide and 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 causing uh, what's called bell mouthing where the where, where the guide wears and and doesn't hold the valve very steadily. It actually on Continentals, it's uh, uh, running excessively rich, is more likely to bell mouth the guide on on like homings because of their sodium filled exhaust valves. Uh, uh, running too rich is more likely to cause um, a a stuck valve that doesn't close completely because there's too much stuff built on the uh, built up on the valve stem to, for the for the valve springs to fully retract the valve either way you you, you have a burn valve condition and either way uh, you wind up having to pull the cylinder so it really doesn't matter uh, keeping um, cylinder head temperatures well controlled uh, is another thing that's fairly important to uh, to extend exhaust va valve uh, uh, life um, that's about all I can think of. Um, okay. Uh, Paul asks, for cracked cylinders, is there a specific area of the cylinder to pay attention to to find them? Well, um, there are basically two broad categories of cracks. Uh, there are cracks up... Um, near the top of the cylinder uh, that virtually always emanate from one of the holes or bosses in the cylinder. Most common place for uh, cracks to start are at spark plug holes, particularly top spark plug holes. Uh, fuel injector bosses for fuel injected engines or, or, or the, uh, the primer bosses for Engines where the, where there are primer nozzles screwed into the cylinder head as opposed to into into a, uh, an induction manifold. Um, those are typically where where uh, cracks start up in the upper part of the cylinder head. Uh, none of those cracks are safety flight items. Um, when we see them and we verify them, we typically have to in, replace the cylinder. But I've literally never heard of ever heard of any sort of a catastrophic cylinder failure due to to cracks like that. There are also cracks that sometimes emanate from uh, the exhaust valve uh, guide boss on the inside of the cylinder um, that typically can't be uh, 
found by an, an external inspection but can be found by a borescope inspection. And a crack that starts at the exhaust valve uh, guide boss on the inside typically grows until it, it, it gets to either a top or a bottom spark plug hole and then stops. Most of these cracks start at a hole and grow until they end at another hole and then you know they're stop drilled at both ends if you will and aren't going to go any further. Uh, they never cause any sort of a uh, any sort of a safety issue. Uh, we do have to look for them and but and we do need to retire the cylinder if we if we see them but 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 they they never make you fall out of the sky. The cracks that that are more dangerous are cracks at the head to barrel junction of the cylinder. Um, and those are hard to inspect for um, because um, to inspect for them externally you have to look between the cylinder fins for uh, evidence of, of, of exhaust staining and it's not easy to do. Uh, you can inspect for them with a bore scope because they occur uh, well I, I take it back you can inspect for them uh, for them with a bore scope um, but and the reason those kinds of cracks are more significant is because if those cracks go undetected long enough um, it is possible uh, to have a head to barrel separation on the cylinder which will shut the cylinder down very dramatically um, on six cylinder engines a head to barrel separation has to my knowledge never caused an off airport landing or anything like that because a six cylinder engine on five cylinders makes better than 80 percent horsepower it shakes real bad it, it gets the pilot pretty upset but it, you always have plenty of power to go fly to an airport and and and, and put it down um, head to barrel separations on four cylinder engines have been responsible for some off airport landings because of four cylinder engine doesn't doesn't run very well on three cylinders um, but the head to barrel junction cracks uh, which typically um, follow the, the, the top thread of the head to barrel junction and, and gradually grow uh, circumferentially around the cylinder and norm typically that if the, they have to get to a third to a half of the way around the cylinder before the junction is weakened to the point that the head actually separates those are the most dangerous kinds of cracks um, and they're also the hardest ones to detect. Okay, great. Uh, about out of time here, let's just get to one or two more questions. Jim wonders, uh, when rechecking the filter for metal, do you have to drain and replace with new oil each time? Um, not necessarily. Um, I normally would do that, um, but but there, there's no necessity. You could conceivably just cut open the filter, look at it, and leave the oil in there. Okay. And uh, last question here. Larry just wonders, uh, can uh, crankcase cracks ever be welded? Yeah, sometimes they can, sometimes they can't. Uh, normally, um, the, the, the engine has to be torn down. The crankcase would be sent out to a, a crank case refurbishment company like Divco in Tulsa or uh, ECI down in San Antonio and they would do a full evaluation of the crankcase and then report back as to whether the the crankcase have is is repairable or not um, but yes yeah, some sometimes crankcase cracks are well repairable uh, it just depends on where the crack is located Okay, and let's just do this last question. Michael says, uh, I have had some valve sticking issues on my uh, C65 and my Taylorcraft BC12D. Once a valve sticks, are there any alternatives to cylinder removal? Absolutely. Um, and those, those um, older small Continental engines were, were prone to valve sticking, all, uh, much like lead combings are. Although the the big bore Continentals uh, 360s, 470s, 520s, 550s, very seldom stick valves. It's just a different design. But if you have uh, a, a sticking valve, um, it is uh, possible to uh, 
remove the valve springs, remove the valve guide, I mean remove the valve from the guide uh, and let it drop into the cylinder using some mechanics, uh, you know, fingers, <laughs> if you know what I mean, uh, 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 just a tool that they use for that. And then ream out the guide and then work the valve back into the guide, reinstall the springs and you're good to go. Um, it's done by something known as the rope trick, which almost all mechanics know about and have done. Uh, and it's it, it, in general, it's possible to resolve uh, sticking valve problems without removing the cylinder. Does Continental have a service bulletin that describes that process? Uh, or I, I I know Lycoming does. I'm Lycoming not sure does. about about Continental, um, okay. but. Most A and P's uh, have have had experience doing that. It's not anything that will really surprise anybody. Great. Well, Mike, thank you. That was an excellent presentation and a lot of great detail. A lot of nice comments from everybody. With complimenting you for uh, fantastic information and a really nice presentation again. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, well, any thanks, last Jim. comments? Well, uh, only that uh, my usual last comment, which is that. Uh, if, if anybody had a question that didn't get answered or if a question comes up uh, afterwards, uh, note down my email, which is on the screen, and uh, feel free to email me. And I, I always try to answer everybody's questions.